Welcome to the Fancier Brew Podcast. I'm Andy, the Northern Diver. In this series, I'll be discussing adventure, conservation, and progression in scuba diving with some really interesting and inspirational divers that you might or not have heard of. The podcast is supported by Northern Diver International and you, the listener, through Patreon. So grab yourself a brew and enjoy this week's episode. All right, Rich Walker, welcome to Fancy Brew Podcast. Second time on, mate. Thanks for coming. I oh, know. Thanks. Good to be back, mate. We were supposed to talk earlier on in the year um, after talking about ghost fishing last year, weren't we? We were, yeah. Um, so, how's things, mate? Yeah. Is the year certain, starting to pan out a bit better? Things are looking good, actually. Yeah, I'm pretty busy. Um, I'm up at Cape and Ray at the minute. Um, I've been teaching here for the last couple of days and uh, back down south. Uh, this week and got some tech courses down in Plymouth. So yeah, yeah, things are looking good. Awesome. What are you teaching at Capers? I was doing a GUE fundamentals course. All right, cool. I'm probably as guilty as the next person. What I know about GUE is very little. I've read Jared's book and I thought it was mm-hmm. like, right, I need to change everything I do here. So I sort of went with the DIR principles and stuff. And I like that a lot. And I kind of see GUE divers as this sort of elite ninja type style of where i would like to get to one day although i've never met anybody other than t- chatting to you i've never met anyone that's done it yet so what can you tell me or someone who might be listening to this who who's got that idea but doesn't really know and and, and why perhaps they'd want to follow that dir route so i think for me it's always I'm, i've always been kind of driven to be better at whatever i do really i always i always look to people that are better than me uh, whatever it is really and I think you know what have I got to do to make myself better at, at let's say diving because that's kind of what we're talking about yeah so I've always wanted to be a better diver and I still want to be a better diver and I think if anybody's out there that that thinks that all GUE divers are some kind of elite sect it's not true we're all on a path to try and make ourselves better all right to try and improve yeah. our skills our knowledge um improve the quality of the diving that we do to do more interesting, fun, productive dives. So the whole GUE community is all about going and doing cool, fun stuff underwater. All right. And to do that, it's, it's better if everybody's a decent diver and, you know, people work on their skills as well as you know, places to go and projects to get involved with. So like I say, we're all on a path and we're all just trying to get better. Yeah. I totally agree with that. You know, why not be, the best you can possibly be and i've i've kind of strived through all my life to do that but this is the only sport or interest i've had that's allowed me to do it and i've found Mm. it quite easy and natural to progress that way um but as i said i think it's a perception i probably picked up rightly or wrongly because like i said i've never actually met or dived with anyone that's done gue so I guess people see them as really, really good. So like, like an elite sportsman, if you will, you know, if you were on a golf course and you seen Tiger Woods, Tiger, what's it, Tiger Woods, I can't even say his name. If he was whacking a ball around and doing really well, you go, well, he's quite elite, wouldn't you? Whereas, yeah. cause he's a pro or the, the golf course pro. Whereas if I turned up, the ball would be going left, right, and ne- definitely not down the center. So I would aspire mm. to be like that person. So, um, yeah. so fundies and fundamentals, same thing, obviously that's, that's the first stage, isn't it? So you, could you turn up as a brand new diver, as in never dived? Do you, is that the the start level, or do you need to come with sort of prior experience? What's what's the, right, the so sort there's, of crack? There's two ways. There's two ways into to to being a GUE diver, and you've got if you've never ever dived before, so you are 100% never dived, no no certification at all. We've got an open water certification. There's a training course that brings you in to make you a scuba diver. Right. Now more, I mean, it's a brilliant course. I've got a couple on the go at the moment and, you know, it really is a thorough, fun kind of ground in, in all things scuba diving. Yeah. But if you're already a diver, as I'm guessing most of your listeners probably are, then we have something called the GUE fundamentals course. And what that is, it's open to anybody that's got an open water certification or higher. And I've had divers that have got five or six dives after their open water. And I've had divers that are tech instructors with 3000 dives. Um, so it, it has something for everyone. And what it is, is a, is a real back to basics on your skills, things that you probably haven't done since you're open water. And then you only touched on it quickly. 
but it's going right back to doing weight checks, doing um, proper buoyancy, having a look at your propulsion techniques, your fin kicks. Can you gas shear properly? Can you do an ascent while you're gas shearing? And can you do all of these skills proper and neutrally buoyant? And that for me is like what makes a good diver. If you look at, you kind of talk about elite divers and things like that, but let's just talk, what, what does a good diver look like in the water? They're a diver that, to me, that they have really good buoyancy. And whatever they're doing, taking a picture or surveying a wreck or counting marine life, whatever it is they chose to do, they don't move. You know, they're in absolute control of that, of that environment and themselves within it. So the fundamentals is basically the, the starting point of that process, really. Yeah. Is there a, a defined sort of setup? Could you do it on closed circuit as well as open circuit? Is there... No, the fundamentals course is an open circuit course, and GUE has quite a quite a prescriptive um, equipment configuration. And we do that because it's uh, it's basically GUE was was set up so that we could have we could do lots of project work around the world, and there's a huge advantage to standardisation. And you can argue whether the standards right or wrong; it doesn't really matter. As soon as you standardise something, things get easier. Yeah. All right? So I mean, I can lend equipment to to teammates and we can i can borrow gear when i travel and it's all the same gear and it all works the same way so there's kind of an introduction to that equipment configuration how it works the fundamentals course at the moment is not a closed circuit it's not open to closed circuit divers but right. this is a this is a bugbear of mine i, I find people buy rebreathers and they sell all their open circuit gear it's like <laughs> well, why did you do that you know it doesn't make yeah. sense to me um you know, it's like it's like buying a new pair of flip flops. So you sell your walking shoes. Doesn't make sense. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'll be honest. I uh, we a couple of weekends ago. Now we went over to North Wales because I'm only down the road from you. Just about half a dozen junctions down from where you are now. Okay. So we went over yeah. to North Wales for the weekend, and it was a five or six meter dive in a little little bay, and it was amazing to just put my halcyon backplate and wing and harness and that on, fifteen liter cylinder. And just go and have an open circuit dive. Now I've picked up rebreather last year, which it wouldn't have suited that dive at all. No, but it was all, no. so so nice to just put it back on. And the only thing I have sold is my twin set because we've we had two, and there's there's kind of it would never get dived. I would always yeah, ever yeah. use my wife's if I needed that particular configuration because right. she wouldn't be yeah. there. But I I would I'd never get rid of it all because. There's, there's like horses for courses, as they say, isn't there? Every Absolutely. configuration yeah. suits a different sort of dive. So, yeah. The reason I asked about the rebreather one is because I, I'm sure you know, as soon as you go on to rebreather, it's another, it's a third space of gas that you have mm -hmm. to sort of manage. And I'm just not as comfortable in the water as I was. And I, I think, think that's normal. Yeah, I think that's normal when people first first go to rebreathers because, like yeah. you say, there's an extra, there's an extra volume of gas but i'll be honest what i what i find is to go back to open circuit again what 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 does a good open circuit diver look like they're ones that are in control of their buoyancy but the thing that that gives you that precision control is an awareness of your breathing pattern mm. okay because you get a change in your breathing pattern because you're stressed with a task or you're kind of holding your breath because you're taking a picture that's going to have an impact on your buoyancy so a real good awareness of your breathing pattern makes you a good open circuit diver now to come back to the rebreather side of things as you're as you're learning how many dives have you got on your rebreather now how many hours um probably close to 20 i think right okay so you're probably starting to work out and learn and you will be taught this in your course but that that minimal loop volume is the key to all your stability yeah yeah and that for me is the same as my breathing control on open circuit so yeah. every time my loop gets it's too big or too small, that's when my buoyancy falls apart. So my constant attention is on making sure that that loop volume stays it's optimal. Stays optimal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's definitely the hardest thing. And then you've kind of I almost have to come out of trim to just blur a load of gas out. And it I mean my wife said to me the other day, we were diving up at Ull's water, which is like diving in a pint of Guinness. So she probably couldn't have seen me anyway. But mm. she said, You don't look horrendous, but I think my awareness is so heightened of where i would like to be i feel that i must look terrible to everybody else that i'm with but if she doesn't notice it i'm clearly trying hard enough to maintain yeah. some semblance of order i think that's quite common i felt it when i first went to the rebreather i thought you know yeah. I'm, I'm 
really missing the precision that I have on open circuit. Yeah. But people that looked at me, certainly, well, not in the first couple of times, but <laughs> after like 50 hours or so, people said, oh, no, you look just fine on it. But inside, you feel I'm not, I've not got the precision that I had on open circuit. I've stopped holding my breath on it as well now, because you do yes. that at the first, don't you? Take yeah. a, a breath yeah. or so that's going to save you, and it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't help, no. <laughs> no, oh, it's all good fun. So tell us about who you are then, because obviously I, I, I've met you, well, we've had a chat before, and we know what you get up to. Sure. Um, so moving on slightly from GUE now, mm. who, who are you? Who am I? That's a good question. It's kind of philosophical as well, isn't it? But <laughs> let's keep it to dive in, eh? Um, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to know the other side. <laughs> <laughs> We'll do so, another. We'll do another one. We'll do another record. Yeah, we'll do later. another one of them. Yeah. <laughs> so I started diving back in 1991. I'd always wanted to be a diver. My my parents uh, got together in a scuba diving club, as uh, Ilford branch of the British Sub Aqua Club in East London. Yeah. And when I was growing up, there was kind of dive gear all over the house. And at the time, you know, kids didn't dive. It wasn't allowed. But I always knew that one day I'd be a diver. And in 1991, I, I kind of walked past a colleague's office and I saw there was a load of scuba diving gear in his office. So I just said, this stuff, what is it? How do, how do, I, how do I use it? And he said, you know, you have to come and join the local BZAC club, which is what I did. So my first dives were down on Chesil Beach, I think, in Swanage. And yeah. very quickly, I realized that kind of wreck diving was, for me, where it was at. That was what I wanted to do. And, you know, I spent, you know, a couple of summers diving wrecks in the kind of 20, 30 meter range, um, just having a, having a real blast exploring wrecks along our, our south coast really. Um, and just loved it and loved it. And I think it was 94, I moved up to Sheffield with work. I was working at the University of Sheffield and I got involved with the, the Sheffield University Sub Aqua Club up there, who I'm still very good friends with. Yeah. And started to dive places like the west coast of Scotland, the Farne Islands, Abs, scapa flow so just kind of the northern end of the country really and again everywhere i dived it was just i love wreck diving that's that's what i like doing most um at the time you know me and me and a couple of my friends in the sheffield university club we were you know we were hungry to go and find deeper wrecks and more interesting stuff and, and that kind of thing so we started playing around with technical diving and this is the mid 90s so there was no there was no books on this there was no manuals on it you know yeah. you had to kind of make it up yourself really and experiment with all kinds of horrible things that i don't want to talk about anymore <laughs> <laughs> some of them worked but most of them didn't um so so you know we'd play around diving deeper wrecks and realize that things you know there was something missing we didn't have any kind of information and at, you know a similar kind of time somebody plugged my computer at work into a thing called the internet I didn't really know what it was for. It just seemed to be another way that my boss could send me messages and, you know, <laughs> it was very pointless, really. Um, but I decided to see if anyone on the internet um, was interested in scuba diving. And I found loads of information, and particularly about technical diving, or what was becoming technical diving. And there was ideas on equipment configuration, uh, gases, decompression, teamwork, all sorts of stuff. I, it was just what I'd been looking for for years. And the people that I was most kind of kind of aligned with in the way I thought was the group that ended up becoming what is now GUE. Right. So there was a group called the Woodville Cast Planes Project that had an equipment configuration. And they were and a team system and a, a strategy for breathing gases that were allowing them to do really quite incredible dives that, you know, even today, even by today's standards are, you know, spectacular achievements. And I started looking to how they were doing that and tried to get training with them and and I couldn't really because there was no European outlet for, for what became GUE. So I kind of fuddled it together and I did loads of training with uh, the likes of Richie Stevenson, Phil Short and um, you know we I, we got ourselves moving and we you know we, we learned some stuff and uh, we had a great time. But in 2003 I thought you know I'm gonna I'm gonna go to Florida and I'm gonna learn learn some stuff. I'm gonna learn to cave dive because I've never done cave diving and I'm I already knew how to tech dive. I thought I knew everything about tech diving now because I'd done all the courses there were. So off I go to Florida to, to do my cave class. And I, and I figured it would just be, you know, five days of swimming around and a big high five at the end. And I'd be a cave diver. <laughs> and it was, it was nothing like that. It was, it was just, 
hard, challenging, but a lot of fun course. Um, and at the end of it, I just realized that, you know, if I'm going to, I'm going to carry on diving. This is the way I want to dive. I thought it would just be another agency and another another ticket, but it wasn't. I thought this is actually the real deal, and this is the way I want to dive. Yeah. And ultimately, I decided that I was going to teach. So a year or so later, I, I kind of contacted GUE HQ and said, "Look, I kind of like to teach the GUE. Do you think that's even remotely possible?" And they said, "Yeah, we have a we have an instructor training course in Europe. Actually, it's at Portofino Divers in Italy." So I hopped on a plane and did my instructor course. And at the end of 2004, um, they made me a fundamentals instructor, Wicked. which was awesome. And I just spent the weekends, actually, when I was, I was still in Sheffield, so I spent the weekends doing fundamentals courses up here in Cape and Ray. Yeah. And uh, I've been coming here ever since. And basically, 2007, I quit my real job and uh, ran away to the circus to become a full-time diving instructor. <laughs> so that's basically what I've been doing since but when it comes back to it, i've dived caves i've dived tropical waters i've dived all kinds of stuff but what it comes back to to me is uk wreck diving that's what i just love doing yeah i um i, I share the same sort of interest and passion what i don't share is a a, a group of people with the same mm. sort of mindset that weekend in weekend out want to go doing that i just have yeah. loads of people locally that want to go diving and we've all got different interests and it's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's not killing me inside. Do you know what I mean? But it's, it give me the opportunity and I'm there sort of yeah, opportunity, yeah. but they're just few and far between at the minute and kind of where I am, as you well know, that sort of West coast of England, sort of that from the Lake district down to North Wales, there's not an awful lot. You've got to go into North Wales and then sure, you still need yeah. a boat. So yep. it'll come, you know, this time there's, um, there's plenty of people around. It's just, probably the wrong time of the world in the world in it to be trying to break new ground <laughs> yeah, doing that exactly. yeah yeah so have you got any decent trips coming up have you planned anything can you plan anything i'm trying not to plan too much at the minute um i'll, I'll be up in scaffer a couple of times towards the back end yeah. of the year um but no i mean i'm normally traveling around a lot but this year yeah. i'm i'm kind of looking at it i mean most of my teaching for a long while was in croatia which got some great wrecks out there yeah. and i did i went there yeah because the wreck the, uh, the wrecks are, are really good and the history is great, but the weather is super stable. So, you know, I can just teach, teach, teach. And, and the, the, yeah, the water's a bit warmer, but there's still, there's some similarities between UK. It's still pre pretty chilly at depth. So it's not completely an alien environment for a UK wreck diver. So there's enough commonality there that, that makes it a good venue for me. Um, but that's not gonna happen this year. Um, uh. but I just can't see it. So I'm really, refocusing my my work this year on on teaching in the uk yeah. and hopefully the the weather will be kind to me and <laughs> not blow me out on every course i want to teach i think it's the viz though isn't it that, that's what we need to worry about in it like cape and ray's not brilliant at the minute we were diving there a fortnight ago and it was it was horrendous you couldn't see your hand in front of your face but then that's, i think it's getting better isn't it yeah. i think better. Yeah. it's not that it's not like that now you've got a good no. four or five meters now that's good so where do you tend to go in um in Croatia, do you go to Viz, do you? Um, I've been to Viz, uh, but most of my work is up in Pula. Right. Or around Pula, a little village called Kanitsa. And okay. I dive out of a facility called Kanitsa Diving, funnily enough. And basically, the, re the reason it's a good place is for the wreck diving. And the city of Pula was, in the First World War, held by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And then the Second World War was held by the Germans. But it's the secret to controlling the Northern Adriatic, and it's mm -hmm. a big natural harbor. So for both of those wars, there were at least nine minefields laid all around the approaches to Pula. And ultimately what that means is there's just a wealth of wrecks because they a didn't always- A junkyard of wrecks. It's basically a great big junkyard, yeah. And they've all wow. been sunk by a mine. Generally speaking, they hit a mine and break in two pieces. So there's, I mean, from, from Kanitsa diving, I can count one, two, three, four, five, six wrecks that I can hit within 40 minutes to an hour. Laughing then, eh? Proper wrecks, all, well, not, not all just purpose sunk. 42 to kind of 60 meter range. So they're, they're perfect for kind of tech, early tech training. Yeah. Um, and even some of the more deeper stuff as well, you know? So, yeah. you know, and they're all beautifully intact, mostly sit on the keel. Um, so it's just, it's just heaven really. So. Mm. 
So now what you've done is convinced me that I need to do, get my mod two done. There you go. Yeah. I never had a reason. Now I've got one. You're a nightmare. <laughs> you are. <laughs> Oh, well, we had we had to, um, plans very early summer last year to go out to Viz. There was a few mm. of us, and it was a little like, like it's hardly what Phil Co uh, Phil Short would call an expedition, but in yeah. BSAC military diving terms, it was an expedition. There was a, ten of us going to discover new ground for us, and and we all had something we would gain from going. There was no training as such. It was all like mm. I was going to take my camera, my wife was going to do some ADP like advanced decompression mm -hmm. or, or accelerated decompression to get there you know so it would all pan out and obviously the world closed down and went no you're not playing out yeah and yeah. i think we're the same as you we're just going to sort of stay around the uk this year and i just fingers crossed that you know we get out of it by the end of this year and start afresh no, i think it's all it's all about making the opportunities that you've got i mean yeah you know if you if you if you accept that we're in the uk now for this year then you know the uk we always i've always said it the uk's got some amazing diving so Absolutely. I'm just going to revitalize that in myself. You know, I'm going to go back and enjoy UK diving again this year, yeah. which I have to confess, I haven't done for a while. So I'm actually yeah. really looking forward to getting out and visiting some of my old haunts and maybe a yeah. few new ones as well. You know. Ace, what, what would, I hate this term bucket list, but what, have you got any bucket list dives in the UK? No. Have you not? Have you done them all? No, I haven't done them all. I, <laughs> As soon as I start making lists, there's other things that go on and the list just explodes. So yeah. <laughs> I just, I'm very kind of pragmatic. If an opportunity comes up to do something, I then, yeah. then I crack on and do it. And there's a few, there's a few little projects I've got my eye on that will need a little bit of work, a little bit of investment in time and yeah. logistics and stuff like that. So yeah, watch this space. Keeping them well under your hat, I noticed there, oh, that right little now. top of the nose. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Ace. Um, so let's talk about your rebreather. What do you what do you dive? What what's your sort of I've got a JJ. Good lad. I've got a JJ. I, that's what I bought. I like it. Yeah, yeah I like it. It's well, no, I like it. Uh, <laughs> I get on with it. We have an understanding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think mine's the boss of me at the minute. I'm, I'm uh, trying to get, I'm trying to get get it by the reins. You've got to get it by the throat, not by the reins. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I like the JJ. It's um. I tried quite a few rebreathers, um, but the JJ to me is kind of a, has a nice balance between kind of looking after you and not treating you like a kid. So, you know, the, the sheer water software is great. It, you know, if you, if you miss a deco stop or you do something a bit daft, it tells you and goes, you want to do something about that? Or should I just carry on doing what I'm doing? And you can either do something about it or just tell it to shut up, which I quite like. Yeah. It doesn't start hooting at you and shaking your mouthpiece and doing all sorts of weird stuff. So uh, it treats you like an adult, which I like, and it's yeah. it's pretty, it's it's a pretty agricultural piece of machinery. You know, it it's quite difficult to break it, and if you do break it, it's not that hard to fix it. No. So for project work, expedition stuff, yeah. It is a question for you. Do you have a cover for the top yours? I've seen people with cave shields and people with like I when, when I did my oh. training with Kieran, he had like some neoprene cover that went over the top. You know, because you get all crap that goes in the top sometimes. You know, around the O rings, yeah, and yeah, around the head. And I'm like debating whether to get one because I've had clean rings a few I've times. I've never though. used one. I've I've asked people that do use them, and they say, yeah, it cuts down the the garbage that gets in there, but doesn't stop it. So no, okay, save myself forty quid and just well, wash quite, it every yeah. time. I just have wash. It. Just you got to run a hose over it anyway, so you know. Might as well, aren't you? yeah, yeah. Mm. So what can you, what what else you want to talk about? What can we talk about that we've not? Ooh. I know we've done UK wreck diving, haven't we? We've done um, we've done rebreathers a bit, um, GUE fundamentals. Uh, what do you think your guys want? To, what are your readers inter interested in most? Well, I, I, if you if you're happy to keep what what not waffling, I can waffle all day, mate. Yeah. <laughs> if you're happy to keep going, you know, continue down that GUE because I've other than you, I've never had the, the opportunity to talk to anyone about GUE and see hmm. perhaps investigate where it were you as a as a GUE diver or I, let's say I came on, I was on your fundies course now, yeah. where would that go? Cause right, okay. I don't really know, you know, so. Right. So, the, so apart from being like a, a really strong buoyancy and kind of basic skills course, the fundamental fundamentals is also kind of an introduction to what GUE is all about. Yeah. And with that comes kind of the introduction to the community and the, the kind of the rest of what GUE is all about. So, you know, you could, you could start engaging with something like project baseline, which is our project work. Um, it's it's basically a a 
an infrastructure that allows you to set up your own project, however small, it could be super simple. And the idea behind Project Baseline is it's, a, it's an environmental program. And if you've got a project that you think, I really want to look at, I mean, what's your, what's your local Anglesey dive site? What's your favorite one? Um, we've got Cable Bay or Porthia Scadden. Okay. It's sort of about so, two and a half hours from us. Yeah, so you could, you could set up a, a project in there just to monitor the wildlife in it or the, the microplastics that were collecting in, yeah. the, in the sand. And you could, you could set up a project that, that basically monitored that over a long-term period. And Project Baseline would help you kind of gather your data and organize it and give you advice as to where you could publish it or what you could do with it. All right. Um, and we've just said, well, not we, I didn't, I didn't have anything to do with it, but <laughs> so a good friend of mine, Marcus Rose, um, has kind of cooperated with the University of Chester. And what they're going to do is to have amateur divers, you know, just divers like you and me that go out there and go diving, but he's given them a little sample pot. You just scoop up a bit of bottom, put the lid on it and send it back. And they're going to basically trying to get around the UK um, profile of the microplastics that exist in in the wow. environment so and that's just citizen scientists amateur divers like you and me are going in and contributing to that so there's all kinds of different ways a GUE diver can engage with project work now which i think is really exciting it's, it's great from a from a from a things you can do is that diving with a purpose thing isn't it you yeah. know, things you can do underwater rather than just float around so there's that side of it. And if you've got your own projects, you know, talk to Marcus and he'll set you up with them, tell you how to set it up. Um, if you want to progress on and kind of uh, learn more skills and GWE's got plenty of courses that will kind of help you with that. We have the whole technical program, uh, the tech one and tech two and the, and the rebreather that I, I teach extensively. We have a cave program, cave one, cave two, which basically teaches you all the basics of of cave diving, how you go into a cave, how you turn around and get out again safely, how you do navigation, manage your gas safely, and basically stay safe and work as a team in a cave environment. And then we have our recreational program, which to me is one of the most exciting ones. We have the open water, the advanced and rescue kind of components, and then the advanced sort of 40 meter uh, deep diving program, yeah. which, you know, it's a really well-rounded recreational program. And, you know, I'd, I'd ask your readers, you know, your listeners, if, if you've got friends that want to learn to dive, give the GUE recreational program a look before you, you just go to your, to your paddy dive center. I didn't say that. You said that. Not <laughs> SSI me. dive center. Whatever. No, so I'm, I'm not picking on agencies, but no, no. Don't, don't, don't rule out GUE. It may be what you're looking for. Mm. That's kind of why I wanted to go down that route, because like I said, from day one, there was two sort of things that I picked up from my fellow BSAC divers. It was mm. the yellow box of death, yep. which everyone knows is the, the AP yep. rebreather you're going to die on, apparently. Never seen that <laughs> happen, but I'm sure people have. Although I've, I've seen one in Malta catch fire. That was fun. I um, heard about that. People yeah. die crossing the road. It's not, it's... Yeah. yeah. And then and then the GUE, you you were an elite level diver. Not elitist. I'm not saying that at all. Just they were like the, the top level of diver. Um, hmm. So perhaps I think by by bri bridging that gap, me and you having this conversation now might bring people into thinking. Actually, for me now, that's achievable, and and give that a shot, you know. And, and why not? I, I'm interested. To, the project work, that that bit. I don't know if you saw my face. I, I, that picked up my interest. You know, hmm. expeditions and stuff like that. That's where I, I enjoy the most. You know, so doing a project, a purpose for that dive. Absolutely, hmm. I'm interested. I find projects quite interesting as well because people look at projects and think, oh, I could never do that. I could never engage with that because yeah. what they see is the output, the end, the end stage of the project. So people have put years and years of work into things and they say, hey, look, look what we did. And it's this amazing achievement that, that's been done. But no project starts like that. It starts no. by people jumping in the water, sticking their noses in and going, oh, what's that? Let's go and have a look at that. Let's take a mm. picture of that. And then it kind of builds up from there and it grows into the thing that, that everybody sees. Never, nobody yeah. ever sees the early work. And that's just, just everyday divers going in the water and going, ooh, I wonder where that, wonder where that goes. I wonder, what's that's a funny fish? What is it? You know, <laughs> that's how it starts. Yeah. You know, don't be intimidated by project work is what I'd say. Because a lot of people yeah. are, they think, oh, I could never do that. But you can, you just, you just got to understand that it starts small. It starts just 
simply being inquisitive. Yeah, that's all it is, and that's what diving is all about to me. It's like we, every bit of water I ever go past, I look into it and oh, I wonder what's in there. I wonder what's under it. Yeah, right? I'm just totally inquisitive like that. But and and we we have this luxurious position as divers that we can go places that other people can't go, but they're interested in it. They love to know what's you know what's beneath the surface of our seas. Absolutely. When I talk to non-divers, they're always like, oh yeah, but there's nothing in our seas, is there? You know, you can't see anything. It's like, it's totally not true. <laughs> you show them some pictures and they think that's in our yeah. water. That's in the English sea or the British mm. sea. Like, yeah, it is. So, you know, we, our little projects that we do or even what becomes our big projects, yeah. they're really interesting to the public if you pitch them right. But they start off small, start off small, just that little bit of inquisitiveness. Yeah, well, that that when you asked, you know, what my two or what was my favourite sort of dive site off of Anglesey, Cable Bay was one of them, mm -hmm. and it's, it's just always loads of families. And as soon as you see a couple of divers coming out, like, oh, look at that frogman over there! So all the kids come running over. What have you, right, what have you been yeah. up to? So I quite often I'll get my camera out and go, look, there's a shark in there, and it's only a cat shark, mm -hmm. so it's less than a meter long, and it's brilliant. Yeah. It, you know, you can get right up close to it. But they're dead inquisitive about it, and it, I been knowing my kids for years before i started diving that same bay mm. wouldn't have a clue what was in there because no, they don't no. and it's they're just like oh the sharks in there and they're all buzzing about sharks and that yeah, yeah, i think it's yeah. ace yeah but but then that um what you said about the citizen science that's rearing its head loads more now isn't it people are getting involved in these little projects so often and like you mm. said if, if all you need is like one of them little sample pots just a little scraping of some sand from somewhere you know, yeah. we can all get involved with things like that, can't we? Absolutely. That's how it starts. Mm -hmm. Right. So I need a, a fundamentals course now. I'm not on the plug for a cheap, a cheap one, but what, how do I go about booking it? How do I get on one? What do I need? So what kit and equipment just, set up? Right. So you can go to, to my website, which is wreckandcave.co.uk. All right. Yeah. You can find me there. Um, you can find me on Facebook. I'm pretty easy to find send me an email, send me a message. Um, there's a list of all the courses I've got planned on the website as well. Yeah. Just drop me a line. And what I've also got is a little mailing list. If you're interested in fundamentals, just stick your name on it. All yeah. right, there's a sign up page on the website. And what that lets you do, basically it will deliver all the equipment configuration information that you need. There'll be, there's a frequently asked question section. And basically on that, on that newsletter, I just, I just ping it every time I've got an opening on a class and you'll yeah. get notified. But quite often what tends to happen is I get a couple of people approach me and say, oh, we want to do a class and I end up setting one up from them. So I've got the ones that I plan and schedule, but I'll also make them kind of ad hoc if people come and just say, oh, I want to do a course and are you free on this on this three or four days? And we do it that yeah. way. As, as far as kit and configuration, it's pretty standard anyway, isn't it? You know, so it'd be the long these hose. Days, yeah, these days it is. It's back plate and wing. Um, it's, yeah, the long hose arrangement. Um, good fins, uh, solid fins, not split fins, because they don't really work that well. <laughs> <laughs> let's um, jump on that bandwagon. <laughs> let's not Let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's a fairly standard configuration these days. Um, yeah. It used to be kind of an unusual thing, but now about half the divers I see are in something more or less close and it's not brand specific a lot of people think it has to be a certain brand yeah um, but it doesn't as long as it as long as it's as long as it's a back plate a harness and a wing we're more or less all right but if you've got any yeah. questions just just ping me a message and i'll kind of yeah. talk you through it and i've always got gear that we can lend out if you know if your gear isn't quite right you can yeah. i'll always swap it out for something for you i've seen that with a few instructors now where they, there's a preference certainly when i did my rebreather course for instance i'll talk about kieran because you know he's quite happy for that is there was a preferred list you know and then the, the the basic equipment list and i i use this it wasn't you must use that but the hmm. the ability to borrow something to see that that's a benefit yeah. over what you've got and then you actually think well if i have that i'll be able to achieve that throughout my diving hmm. And yeah. then I, I had a similar conversation about, you know, travel wings and travel this, that and the other. Why would you have a different set of kit for going away? Just buy a suitcase and put all your stuff in. So when you get in the water, it's exactly the same and you can you can just be the same as you are wherever you are in the world. I don't know, mate. I don't know why anyone would do that. 
So. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, why, why have a carbon fiber backplate when you're used to having one that weighs two kilos made of stainless steel? Because well, now, yeah. now you have to put a weight belt on and your trim's different. And I, I think, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll use a lightweight backplate if, if I'm going to the tropics and using a really lightweight undersuit yeah. or even a, even, a, even a, heaven forbid, a wetsuit. Yeah. Um, but no, if I'm using, if I'm diving heavy, heavy dry suits anywhere, then no, the steel plate comes. You know. I've seen you there's suck, some that's suck it up like, on the baggage, don't you? Yeah, there's, I've seen some that are like I don't know, a quarter of an inch thick, and I think bloody hell, <laughs> I won't want to <laughs> take that on holiday though. <laughs> no, 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 it's good. Um, so what's the time scale for that course? Is it a two day course? Three? Was it fundamentals work? is a four day course, and the way right. it breaks down is normally the first day is kind of classroom work, and I get I get break the back of the kind of academic components. Um, we do a full gear set up. So we go through all the equipment, we'll make sure the harness is set out properly, make sure all the hoses are the right length and configured right. Um, and we just give a proper education on why all the things are like they are. So, I yeah. mean, we're, as I said, we're quite specific on certain areas of the equipment configuration. And it's important that everybody understands why it's like that. Yeah. It's not just a, you will do it like this. Every, every rule that we have has got a very good reason behind it. Yeah. So I think it's important that people understand rather than just be told what to do. So that's the first day, really. And then we've got three days, basically, of diving. Um, two dives a day, probably an hour long each. Um, and like I say, we start with the first dive is, you're going you're gonna to laugh, but I do 20 to 30 minutes of neutral buoyancy, just trying to get those divers to stand still. All right, can you float in the water without flapping your hands and flapping your feet and just not move? Which if you ask everyone, yeah, they could do that. And then they kind of, they look a bit funny and go, mm, I've never actually tried it. Yeah. <laughs> Most people keep swimming. So there's 20 yeah. minutes of kind of explaining to people how the dry suit's got to be set up, how the wing's got to be set up. And what most importantly, like I said earlier, what your breathing pattern's got to do. So 20 minutes working on that. And then we'll progress on to doing a few fin kicks like the frog kick and the flutter kick. We'll get out. Um, I'll do a video debrief. So show you exactly what you've been doing and what you need to do to improve. The second dive is more about fine control. So the backwards kick, the helicopter turn, so you can turn on the spot like that. Yeah. And then we've got, if you, if you take it to there, you, if you think about it, you can stand still, you can go forward, you can go backwards, you can go left and right, and hopefully you can regulate your up and down nicely. Yeah. Now comes the time to see how good it is. So we start giving them little tasks to do and they're nothing that you haven't done in ordinary open water course so it's like take your regulator out and put it back in again but now it's all got to be done neutrally born and flat trim all right so take the regulator out and put it back in so the one the big thing that everybody kind of gets brought out by is when you were taught to do that you were taught to take the regulator out and blow out all right but now <laughs> i'm going to tell you you've got to stay neutrally buoyant so if you blow out you're going to sink so you're not allowed to blow out all right, so then there comes in the whole connection to your breathing cycle. And when you take the regulator out, it needs to be when you're right in the middle of that breathing cycle. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to float or sink. Mm -hmm. So it's getting people to think, slow down, and think about their buoyancy, their trim, and their position. Like 90% of their effort needs to be on that. And the, the little 10% is doing the silly little skills, like taking a regulator out or clearing a mask or, or whatever it is we're doing. Yeah. But the, the goal is to do those simple scuba skills, but neutrally buoyant. So that's dive two. Um, then we go on to uh, dives three and four, which are gas sharing drills. So using that long hose properly, making sure you can donate it, um, organize your theme into a, into a position where you can swim back to a shot line safely without pulling the regulator in anyone's mouth. You can communicate properly. Um, dive four is a valve drill. So can you shut down your valves on your single or your double tank? Can you get your hand back on it and manipulate all the valves? Um, dive five, which is on the fourth day of the course now, is uh, surface marker boy. Um, plenty of other, all the valve drills and drills get repeated again. Yeah. Um, there's a no mask swim, which we do as like a team formation thing. So simulating somebody's lost their mask and you've got to kind of guide them somewhere then you put your backup mask on and surface marker boy ascents. Uh, and the final dive is some rescue skills and a go at any other skills that you kind of wanted to have another look at, really. Yeah. 
And like I said, there's some academic sessions, which a lot of them, a lot of them get done on the first day, but there's normally a couple that are, that are kind of need sweeping up on the, on the subsequent days. And we've got three subjects really, gas management, and you make sure you've got enough reserve gas to get two divers to the surface again. It's not just 50 bar and come up or <laughs> 70 bar back on the boat with under bar or whatever it is. Yeah. Right? It's, a, it's a logical, sensible approach to managing your reserve gas and then a way of thinking about whatever's left. So gas management is one subject we do. We have a really good look at the gas properties, so the physiological effects of the gases that you breathe oxygen, yeah. nitrogen, helium, carbon dioxide. Um, we actually include a nitrox certification in the in the fundamentals class as well. Wow, that's good. And the final, the final kind of big academic topic is decompression. So a little bit on theory and then I can I can do the theory in 15 minutes if I need to, but everybody wants more on deco, all right? So we <laughs> yeah. always end up doing like an hour or so of kind of decompression theory. And we, we just, I just try and answer questions that people have got. So this course I've just done, the, the students were really interested in what gradient factors were and what they really meant. So I kind of diverted out a little bit and mm. gave them a gradient factors lesson as well as kind of a, a basic deco lesson. But cool. and it really, the whole course really is tuned into what that diver needs. All right. And it's kind of funny because I said, you can have divers that have got 10 dives or you can have divers that have got a thousand dives. They all, they all do the same skills, but they all get things at a different level from it. And yeah. I, always, I always found it funny because when I started doing this, teaching this course, I would often get instructors that would come on the class and they were, they were going to try and, and they'd come in and they'd say, all I want to do is copy this class and give it to my students. I'm like, all right, fill your boots. <laughs> and, uh, and I'd teach them the class that they needed. And, you know, these are pretty decent divers. So they got some real fine refinement points and some like some high end stuff. And then, and then they thought that was what the fundamentals course was. So they go and try and deliver all these like super fine, how to be really accurate with your bolt snap clip in and, you know, where exactly to point your light when you're trying to signal. And they try and teach that to their open water students. It's like, no, it don't work because, <laughs> because that's not what they need. You yeah, know, you've got your course that was right for you. And if if, a, if an inexperienced diver comes on the course, then it's going to be all about kind of the real kind of fundamental bits of buoyancy and propulsion. Yeah. So and you're almost doing a, a bespoke properly. course for the individual that comes within the parameters of. That's exactly what it is. It? Every student gets the same class, but a different, but their own version of it. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I think that to me, is, that's my challenge as an instructor to be able to deliver that. And deliver some value to yeah. to every single person that walks through the door. I had a very very famous tech diver come on a fundamentals course here a couple of years ago, and uh, he got a lot from it actually. Cool. Can't say his name because he won't <laughs> like it. He wrote an article on it. it was uh, he wrote an article on it in the diver magazine actually? No, so it's right. not a secret. That was no. Lee Bishop. So Lee Bishop did a fundamentals with me years back. Yeah. And uh, and we taught him some stuff as well. So good stuff. Yeah. What's your your student? Um, instructor ratio how many do you have um standards let me do four but i never do more than three yeah i suppose um, it's quite hard in it to to devote enough time to the, each individual and enough yeah. attention to each i think I, I like small class numbers i can do four but i always i always feel that i've sold the students a little bit short because you know you always have to spread your time equally amongst your students i three i like three is a good number um and I can give the right amount of time for my own to make to make me sleep at night. Mm. You know, I can go away from the class and go, yeah, everybody, everybody got what they needed in that. When it goes yeah. up to four, particularly if you someone struggling, you, you're struggling to give everyone the right kind of the right attention that they deserve, really. So I, I yeah. stick it to three. I never do I, now. I, I do do four every couple of years when I forget how stupid an idea it is, and then it just reminds <laughs> me to never do it again. So. <laughs> isn't that what your your team's normally three anyway? Isn't it? Yeah, we DUE divers normally divers are three um, if if we have the choice. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. One I mean, one it, thing. I, it, go on. Yeah, go on. I was going to say one thing that off the first dive day that I picked up was um, how you talk about balancing your dry suit, mm. which I, I got. Um, I only really learned that when I did my side mount course, and I was yeah. told to dive with me with me dump valve all the way open and have my arms in a different position depending what I wanted mm. to do rather than trying to change trim, just lift an arm up. But different dry suits have a different positioning, don't they, for that dump? 
I do, yeah. And and some people obviously struggle when it's more towards the front because they've got a back entry suit and stuff. And I just think what an absolute nightmare as an instructor if you've got one of those that turn up and it's just not in the right place and, and that's kind of what you're relying on. Yeah, but I mean, I've seen most things in dry suits um, and there's there's techniques and strategies for working with most of it. But the most important one is to not do your buoyancy off your dry suit. Right. Um, which I have to unlearn from a lot of people. They don't like it. They clung onto it from from day one. They were in a dry suit. Really. A lot of people get taught that the dry suit is the right way to to compensate your buoyancy, but it's not. It's wrong. I'm going to go out and say it. There we go. Let's <laughs> let's have a chat about that then, because I I, I agree. Now I've moved on to closed circuit. Mm. I enjoy taking the squeeze out and a little bit of balance in my suit, but yeah. I use my wing now a lot more than I right. ever did. Yeah, and yeah. I, I mean, although there's more to manage, I can yeah. I can manage it. The simple the simple reason to me is that if you want to take out any position you like in the water, and that's actually what trim is. It's not necessarily being perfectly horizontal all the dive. It's taking up the position that you want in the water. All right, you can't have an excess of gas in the suit because the gas will just float to the highest point. If you go a little bit head down, you get you have this glug glug, and you'll have puffy feet and you'll be all upside yeah. down and messed up. So it's, you're a bit like a spirit level in a dry suit. There's this bubble and the bubble floats to the highest point, right? Which makes you unstable. But now let's think about um, exactly how much gas are we talking about? If you do your buoyancy completely off your suit, all right? Let's think about how much of a volume of gas we're putting into the suit. If you take a twin set that's got 12 liters of gas, isn't it? Which weighs something like two kilos per 12 liter cylinder isn't it so you've got four to five kilos of, of heavy weight at the start of a dive when you're at the start of a dive which you need to compensate in terms of buoyancy five kilos requires five liters of gas in a buoyancy compensator to equalize it right to balance yeah. it wow think about what five liters look that's 10 pints Imagine what 10 pints looks like in front of you. And that's a bubble inside your dry suit. Even if you're on a single tank, it's half that, all right? It's yeah. five pints of gas flopping around in a dry suit, all right? And you think that's the right way to dive? Well, I mean, it doesn't right sound very dive. stable at all. It doesn't all, sound very stable. Well, it isn't. It isn't. That's why no. people have to swim around like seahorses and shut their dump valves. So, <laughs> <laughs> so dive that the suit compresses onto you add enough gas that you just get the maneuverability back put the rest in the wing that means you don't actually have to dump that much on the ascent and you're still focusing on on the on the wing for the for controlling your buoyancy on the ascent so don't make your life hard how much are you for that lesson oh you never <laughs> for three minutes <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a mug oh i already have where's yeah, my mug? mug where's my mug you promised it's, me a mug do you remember i did i can't get them out of germany Oh, terrible. This Brexit, I'll, I'll, mate, it's a nightmare, isn't it? I, I don't want to talk about it. I've got, <laughs> parcels, I've got parcels stuck up and down the country in customs that they're not releasing for reasons oh, I don't wow. know. Well, I, I hope know. the next couple of days go very well. And yeah, that'll be fine, yeah. Thanks for coming on for a chat, and we'll, uh, we'll have to you. sort out. I will, I will get you a mug, I promise. I will, uh, <laughs> I, will find out, I will find out what's happened to them and why I haven't got them yet. Yeah, so. no stress, mate. <laughs> Happy days. Well, thanks again for coming on, mate. I appreciate your time. And no worries. We'll catch thanks up for someday. the opportunity. Hope so. Yeah. Take it easy, buddy. See you soon. Cheers, buddy. Thank Cheers you. Cheers to our... Thanks very much to this week's guest for sharing their stories and interesting tales about the underwater world. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I did recording it. For more information on this episode, take a look at the description below. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already and follow us on Instagram for the latest news. Thanks again to Northern Diver International and those of you who have supported me through Patreon. Take care and I'll see you on YouTube.